morning. morning. And welcome you all here this morning in Jesus' name. We're glad you're here at Calvary to worship with us. We're going to start off with a few announcements this morning. But before we do that, we're going to open with a word of prayer. Please pray together with me. Lord, I, I thank you for today. Thank you for the, the bright sunshine and for the, the opportunity we all have to gather together in this place, in this time to hear your word, Lord. We pray that you would open up our hearts and minds and be ready to receive what you have for us today, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. A couple of quick announcements. First of all, I wanted to mention that if you're a visitor here, we'd love to have you stop by at our Welcome Center straight back out of the sanctuary, and uh, we have a small gift for you, so we'd like you to stop by there and grab that. And then I um, wanted to mention there's on the back of your bulletin, there's a, a holiday schedule upcoming events, and you can put those on your calendar. And then I wanted to mention quickly, too, that this is the last week. I think the deadline is Wednesday for the card shower for our, um, our secretary, our administrator, Caitlin. So if you, would, if you have a card for her, drop that off in the office by Wednesday. And I think that's it for announcements today, quick and simple. So um, this is the first Sunday in Advent as we prepare for the Christmas season. So we're going to invite a couple of our youth, Daphne and Micah, to come and light the Advent candle and have a, a reading this morning. So Daphne and Micah. As we light the first Advent candle, the prophecy candle, we focus on hope. Centuries before the birth of Jesus, the people of God longed and waited for the Messiah. Prophets foretold his coming. We too wait and trust for his advent among us. We pray for the same Holy Spirit that moved the prophets to stir our hearts to faith in Jesus' word. In hope, we read in Hebrews chapter 1, Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things. Thank you, Daphne. At this time, we're going to call on our praise team to come and lead us in songs of praise and worship. I invite you to stand as we sing our first song.
At this time, we're going to have our confession of sin. The confession will be up on the screen. I invite you to pray this confession together with me today. Heavenly Father, we rejoice in the coming of your Son, Jesus Christ, to live, suffer, and die for our sins. We know that we cannot have eternal life without his costly sacrifice. Thank you that he became our sacrificial lamb so that we might have the forgiveness of sins and eternal life. We believe that your word, which tells us that there is therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus the Lord. Forgive us and cleanse us from all our sins and help us in all of our words, thoughts, and deeds to honor you and your sacrifice that was given for us. In the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Our verses of forgiveness today are from Micah chapter 7, verses 18 and 19. They say this, Who is a God like you? Pardoning iniquity and passing over transgression for the remnant of his inheritance. He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in steadfast love. He will again have compassion on us. He will tread our iniquities underfoot. He will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. We're thankful for those words of forgiveness this morning. At this time, I'm going to Paul and Paul Christensen for our scripture reading. I invite you to stand in honor of God's word as Paul comes this morning. Take out your Bible, reading from Psalms 55, 55th chapter, verses 1 through 7. And it's on page 782 in the Pew Bible. So reading in Jesus' name. Isaiah 55, 1 through 7. Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. He who has no money, come, buy, and eat. Come, buy wine and milk, without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen diligently to me, and eat what is good, and delight yourself in rich food. Incline your ear and come to me. Hear that your soul may live. And I will make with you an everlasting covenant, my steadfast, sure love for David. Behold, I made him a witness to, my, to the peoples, a leader, commander for the peoples. Behold, you shall call a nation that you do not know. A nation that did not know you shall run to you. Because the Lord your God and the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified you. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Come upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him, to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. There's a lot of good uh, words that go on from there, but I can't read any further. So you're going to have to read the rest of the chapter for yourself. It's really, really a good chapter that really speaks of, uh, of God and, and, of, and to us. You may be seated. Good morning. I, I invite you to turn to the back of your bulletin to the prayer concerns. There's a couple to add to it today. Joyce Sheldon is going to have hip replacement surgery tomorrow, so keep her in your prayers. And a little bit brighter note, Andrew and Michelle Franz, their babies due soon. And if it's not soon enough, they're going to be induced tomorrow. So it's going to be a busy day tomorrow. So I keep them in your prayers as well. Any other prayer concerns? Got to raise your hands really high or I don't see them. Okay. Any more? Brent? Okay. 
Okay, any others? Our son-in-law Ryan's cousin passed away this this week. Richard. Any others? So pray for Jensen. Okay. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for your promises and for the promise that Jesus gave us. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. Lord, we thank you that your promises are true and we can count on each and every one. Lord, we pray that in this opportunity here for this season, Lord, that we as Christians and Christians around the world, Lord, will lead and share Jesus with many other people, Lord. We just pray for those who don't know Jesus, that they come to know him. And uh, we pray that this season might be that time. Lord, for home missions, we pray for Master Pastor Matthew Pillman as he's getting ready to uh, plant the church in Iowa. We pray for Kevin Olson as he has taken the Uganda leadership team with him to uh, Ethiopia, Lord, to uh, open up the Orality Institute there. And we also lift up Pastor Earl Cornyn, and Director of World Missions. And Lord, we do lift up Joy Sheldon and her hip surgery. We pray everything goes well and the doctors are successful and that the recovery will be quick. Lord, we just look forward to tomorrow too for the Franzes, Lord, and the baby coming. And uh, what a joy that will be. Pray for self, safe, safe travel for those returning home from this holiday season. We pray that they had a good time of fellowship and uh, just a good time together this time, Lord, this Thanksgiving holiday. Lord, we lift up Brent and Troy, Brent going into surgery and Troy recovering from his surgery. And uh, Lord, we just pray for both of them, Lord, and that everything will be successful there. We lift up the Stockman family and the loss of Richard, which would be a cousin of Ryan. And uh, just pray for healing there too, Lord. And Lord, we lift up Jensen too after this funeral time, Lord. She uh, she just needs your hand and your care, Lord. And we just uh, pray for her and whatever she needs. We pray that you grant it in Jesus' name, amen. Like to have the kids that are here come up front and help as we begin the message. everybody for coming up. <coughs> really glad that you came. Did you hear something? Today, we're going to look at Revelation 3.20, which talks about Jesus knocking the door. And Jesus wants to come in to our lives, to our hearts, and we should open the door, shouldn't we? 
and let Jesus come in, just like Jack let Nick in, which was a nice thing to do. <laughs> but, but we want to always make sure that we invite Jesus to come into our lives. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you would help these kids throughout their lives in every aspect to always hear and be sensitive to Jesus knocking at their door, wanting to come in, wanting to be part of their lives, wanting to lead them and direct them and help them. And Lord, I pray that you'd give them faith and a heart that's ready and willing to open the door. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So Daphne and Audrey Ann have a little Twix bar that you can have. Uh, before you go sit down, if you need an organic something instead of a chocolatey something, they've got something for you too. So as Pastor Eric said, this is the first Sunday in Advent, and we are looking at uh, some different passages of Scripture through this Advent season. Uh, but this Sunday, uh, one of the things that Advent focuses on is Jesus coming, including his coming daily, every day, always, into our hearts and lives. And we're going to look especially at Revelation 3, verse 20. Uh, we're going to read the context of that, and we'll look at that a little bit too. So Revelation chapter 3, verses 14 through 22. And if you are able, please stand with me out of respect for God's word. Revelation chapter 3, reading verses 14 through 22. And to the angel of the church in Laodicea write... The words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. For you say, I am rich. I've prospered and need nothing. Not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich, and white garments so that you may clothe yourself and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen, and salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Those whom I love I rebuke and discipline, so be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and eat with him. And he with me. The one who conquers, I will eat with him. And sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Let's pray. These are your words, Heavenly Father. I pray that you would transform us. Just as it was, as John wrote it, to the church in Laodicea. Father, give us understanding. Help us to be able to see clearly but Lord, help us especially to hear your voice as you want to speak to us through your word. Help us to listen, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. The striking thing in Revelation 3 verse 20 is where Jesus is standing. And we want to see that, where Jesus is standing. And he calls attention to it by beginning with the word behold there in, in verse 20. It's an interjection. There's not a grammatical connection with the words around it. It kind of interrupts things. And it's like a cry expressing emotion. The root of the word in this exclamation is look. 
C. So this calls us to see why Jesus is here. He says, I stand at the door. Take notice of this, because that's an unexpected place to find Jesus, standing outside the house. And it really is an amazing thing that Jesus stands there. We understand why he's standing there if you look at the context of this passage. This is one of the seven letters to the seven churches in the book of Revelation, this one to the church in Laodicea. I've got a map that shows all seven of these churches, seven cities that these churches were in, that John wrote to, that Jesus sent these letters to. They were actual congregations in cities what is now Turkey. Each of these letters begins with a description of Jesus. We see that in our letter. He is the Amen, the Hebrew word for truth or faithfulness. And it's really defined by the next phrase. He is the faithful and true witness. He is the beginning of God's creation. That is, he's the one who began it. He's not the first one who was created. The New International Version has the idea he is the ruler of God's creation. He's the source, the origin of it all. That's the light, the one who's writing the letter, sending the letter. And then this letter addresses the church at Laodicea. It was the wealthiest city in the province that it was in. It was a banking center. It was famous because it was surrounded by pasture lands. And so there were great flocks of sheep all around the city. And they were known for producing a fine black wool that was in high demand. It was also known for its medical school. It had produced a salve for the eyes that had healing properties. And so we see this city of Laodicea, the things that it was known for become things that Jesus draws on that are parallel to its spiritual life. And you look at it really in verse 17, they thought about themselves, I'm rich. I've prospered. I need nothing. But the reality is they were living for things on this earth. Self-centered, self-sufficient. The other thing that the city was known for in the area is what Jesus gets to in verses 15 and 16. He says, you're neither cold nor hot. You were lukewarm. And most likely, Jesus is referring to the neighboring cities of Laodicea. Again, the map shows Hierapolis, which was about six miles uh, to the north of Laodicea. It was famous for its hot springs. People would flock there for those healing properties in those hot springs. And then Colossae was about 10 miles southeast of Laodicea. And they had pure, clear, warm, or pure, clear, cold water that flowed down from the mountains nearby, refreshing to quench their thirst. And so most likely what Jesus was describing is you picture a traveler who is on the road from Colossae to Laodicea. He's had a refreshing drink in Colossae, filled the water bottle, but as he walks those 10 miles, he approaches Laodicea, he doesn't have any water left. He sees this stream and he goes over and he takes a big drink of water and the water is lukewarm, full of minerals that flow from the hot spring up in Hierapolis. And so I will spit you out of my mouth. The water is horrible to drink. And that language really pictures a, a violent reaction. Gagging, hurling is the idea. And so we see the contrast in verse 17. What they thought of themselves, I'm rich, I'm prospering, I don't need a thing. Versus Jesus' verdict, you're wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. 
And so we get the picture then from Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, Jesus standing at the door and knocking. The church in Laodicea, in their blind self-sufficiency, had in effect pushed Jesus out of the church. They thought their outward prosperity was a sign of God's favor. Their spiritual success, we're doing great. But Jesus says the exact opposite. They said, I don't need a thing. Jesus says, you need everything. But... Jesus' word of judgment to them, I will spit you out of my mouth, is still in the future. It hasn't happened yet. And so Jesus comes and he stands at the door and he knocks. Jesus knocks at the door. It's a present tense, it's a continuous knocking. And just think of how amazing that is, that Jesus comes to this church that pushed him out and stands at the door and knocks. Here is the gospel. What should happen is Jesus should burst into that church like a SWAT team. He should blow down the door. Jesus should come in judgment. And that imagery is used elsewhere to describe judgment. In James 5 verse 9, it says the judge is standing at the door. And we need to remember who this is that's standing at the door and knocking. If you go back to Revelation chapter 1 verses 12 through 16, and you see the picture of Jesus given there. The one who stands at the door and knocks is the one who's pictured there standing in the midst of the lampstands, in the middle of the churches, and his eyes are flames of fire. His voice is like the roar of many waters. From his mouth comes a sharp and two-edged sword. His face is shining like the sun in full strength. When John saw Jesus, he falls at his feet like a dead man. So Jesus doesn't knock at the door as a homeless beggar seeking shelter. Jesus knocks at the door as the master of the house who is expecting his alert servants to immediately respond to his knock and welcome the master in. That imagery <clears throat> comes from Luke chapter 12, verses 35 and 36 where Jesus talks about his coming again. And he says to his disciples, stay dressed for action and keep your lamps burning and be like men who are waiting for their master to come home from the wedding feast so that they may open the door to him at once when he comes and knocks. And so as we see this picture in Revelation 3.20, we need to rem remember who Jesus is. And yet, this is the one who comes and knocks at the door. He doesn't break down the door here. Think about in John chapter 10, Jesus says, I am the door. The one who is the door and invites us to come and knock on the door and want to come in to him, now he comes to us and knocks and asks to come in to us. Again, that is an unbelievable picture of grace. Jesus requests permission to enter, to reestablish fellowship. And as we enter into this Advent season, it's time for each of us as individuals to ask God, where am I at? <laughs> in this picture. Where am I at spiritually? Have I drifted away? Have I pushed Jesus out like the congregation in Laodicea did? Behold, Jesus says, I stand at the door and knock. And notice the next phrase. If anyone 
hears my voice. Jesus talks and Jesus calls us. Do we hear his voice? What is that knocking? What is that calling? How does that happen practically? It can happen when Jesus works in our hearts to make us aware in our conscience of sin that's in our lives. It can happen as Jesus brings circumstances in our lives, a problem that he allows to try to wake us up. But mainly what we should think of here is the word of God, the Bible speaking to us. The words hear and the word voice remind us that Jesus knocking and calling is the word of God. Jesus then says in verse 19, those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. So be zealous and repent. Is Jesus speaking to you and I today? Are we hearing his voice calling? Jesus says, if anyone hears my voice and opens the door. And that's what God wants us to do today, to open that door. Jesus stands and knocks. He calls, but we are still to open the door. And there's a paradox there because it all depends on Jesus. It's Jesus' work, and yet Jesus chooses still to tell us to open the door. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door. And we need to recognize, first of all, that this letter was written to a church. Jesus had been pushed out by the congregation, and he comes to that congregation, and he knocks, and he calls, and he wants to come in again. That church is in danger of judgment, but there's still the opportunity to have Jesus come in and bring renewal and revival. And so this is first a message to us as a congregation, as Calvary Free Lutheran Congregation. Are we hearing his voice, knocking, calling? Have we pushed him out? Are we ready to invite him in? But it's so interesting. It's written to a church. Jesus is standing outside the door of that congregation that's pushed him out. But Jesus says, if anyone, hears my voice and opens the door. And that's singular. And so the invitation is really addressed to each individual in the congregation. What does it look like to open that door? In the previous verse, he talked about repenting. And I think that's what's described in verse 18, where Jesus says to them, buy from me gold refined in the fire so that you may be rich, and white garments so that you may clothe yourself, and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen, and salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. He uses the imagery again from the city, that banking center stocked in gold, the central source of clothing from the wool from the sheep ranching, famous for the eye salve to heal. Jesus says those are the things that you need spiritually. And those things only come from Jesus. But again, notice how this works together. Jesus has told them that they are poor, and wretched and miserable. How can somebody who is poor buy gold or clothes or salve? And that's why Paul read those verses from Isaiah 55. In verse 1, where he tells them, buy without money. That's what Jesus is talking about here. As one writer put it, this is strange and wonderful gospel by. If 
these things that Jesus says we need are priceless. <laughs> Even if we had money, we couldn't afford them. He uses the imagery of buying to remind us of the great value of what's received. But the only thing that we can do is buy it for nothing. And that's the gospel. We're called to pray the prayer that Jesus would have the Laodicean church pray. God, I am miserable and pitiful and poor and blind and naked. I don't have anything to pay with. I don't deserve it. I can't do it. I can't fix it. Please save me. Jesus is the only source of help. We can't even open the door in our own natural power. Romans 1, 16 says the gospel is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. Jesus knocks, he calls, and in that knocking and calling, he gives us the power to receive, to open the door. And look at what we receive. Jesus promised, if anyone opens the door, I will come in. There's no added requirements, no stipulations. If you open the door and clean your life up, if you open the door and do really well, if you open the door and come to church every Sunday, he doesn't say that. He just says, if you open the door, I will come in. I will come in and eat with him. That word for eat is the word that they would have used for their evening meal, the main meal of the day. That meal was a significant occasion in the life of that home. The work was done. They could sit and enjoy their time together. And it was a picture of trust and loyalty, affection, companionship. Jesus says, I will eat with him and he with me. The New Living Translation catches the idea. We will share a meal together as friends. We need to ask ourselves, is that my experience in my relationship with Jesus? Are we sitting down together at the meal, sharing together as friends? Jesus says that's what he will do for everyone who receives him by faith. And look at the promise. This is for the conqueror, to the one who conquers, he says, to the overcomer, the one who's victorious. Who is that? Well, it's not some spiritual elite. That's a description of every believer. First John 4, 5, verses 4 and 5 says, for everyone who has been born of God overcomes is the conqueror. And this is the victory that's overcome the world, our faith. And who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? And look at what he says to the conqueror. Ah, I will grant him, Jesus, the absolute source and giver of all, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne. <laughs> that's an amazing promise. He allows us to share in his rule. 2 Timothy 2.12, if we endure, we will also reign with him. And then look at what Jesus says. I'll grant him to sit with me on my throne as I conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. Jesus puts us in a parallel place with his position at the right hand of the throne of God the Father. That picture makes clear this is Jesus' work. He's done it all. His overcoming of sin and death and the devil on the cross and the empty tomb. Revelation 3, verse 20. It's a verse that is often applied to a person who is an unbeliever. And Jesus is standing outside their life, their heart, knocking on the door, wanting to come in. And that imagery works in that setting and that's something that each of us needs to ask ourselves if you've never opened the door before 
Jesus is calling and knocking. Why don't you open the door for him today? But in the context, this is a word that's spoken to believers, to the church, God's people who've drifted away, who've gotten caught in sin, who are caught up in pride or self-sufficiency, have been distracted by the world. Have we pushed Jesus out? And this is so important as we enter into the season of Christmas. Where do I stand with Jesus? He comes, he knocks. He wants that unhindered fellowship. Is that your experience today? I want to read a quote as I close. <clears throat> One of the writers said, It is the sinner's hour of grace. When the king comes and knocks. Blessed hour indeed. Who would not rush and open the door? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray that this verse that is probably familiar to many of us, this image that we've looked at before, Lord, I pray that you would impress on our hearts and minds the amazing reality of you coming to that Laodicea, Laodicean church that had pushed you out, coming and knocking and calling and wanting to come in. Lord, help us to know and to hear your calling and knocking in our hearts and lives every day. Lord, help us especially as we enter into this season of Christmas to know Jesus, to know that fellowship, to allow him to come and enter in. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing hymn number 423 as we close today. God calling yet shall I not hear. This imagery from this picture in Revelation 3.20. And we're going to sing a lot of verses, uh, but I really encourage you to, to read and focus on the words as we sing. 423, God calling yet shall I not hear.
stand with me as we pray the Lord's Prayer. Pray that that last line we have sung would be true of each of us. The voice of God has reached my heart. Let's pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. In these words of benediction from, Revelation, or from Romans 16, now to him who is able to strengthen you according to the gospel, the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery that was kept hidden for long ages but now has been disclosed through the prophetic writings and has been made known to all nations according to the command of eternal God to bring about the obedience of faith to the only wise God be glory forevermore through Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you.